السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته أمسينا وأمسى الملك لله والحمد لله لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير رب أسألك خير ما في هذه الليلة وخير ما بعدها رب أعوذ بك من شر ما في هذه الليلة ومن شر ما بعدها رب أعوذ بك من الكسل والسوء الكبر رب أعوذ بك من عذاب في النار ومن عذاب في القبر اللهم افتح مسامع قلوبنا لذكرك يا الله please open the hearing channels of our hearts to your ذكر let us continue uh, my brothers and sisters on the subject matter generally of the differences in uh, matters of deen and the role of bid'ah and sunnah to contribute to those differences either in a diversified uh, positive way or in a restricted negative way as we are learning together. And I was dealing with some examples of contested issues concerning the question of bid'ah. And I've been trying to share with you what many ulama have said or do say on every issue, I hope I'm not missing much to share with you in terms of the, the range of the words of the ulama on those matters. Now, for example, uh, one thing is in terms of raising the hands in dua after salah by the imam leading the congregation. First of all, what you see me do usually, and I, after salah, I do raise my hands after dhikr to me. Dua is very important. And that's a sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in general and in details. But usually I have rarely or if at all in this masjid have I done it together with you in a group. Now the question is doing it in that way and raising first of all the hands in dua by the imam after salah. Some even say it is bid'ah. Some. And a bad one, when they say bid'ah, they mean always in the negative sense. First of all, dua in the Quran and in the Sunnah is highly recommended. And in the Sunnah, raising the hands in dua is well established in the Sunnah of Rasulullah when, you know, in dua, when imploring Allah Azza wa Jalla. Now the question is after Salah, can it be done? Now the question, if assuming it was not done, is that enough for an answer? Now remember that. Many, those who say, that's the only main argument that there is. And we have established, I hope, from the linguistic and the usuli fiqhi perspective and the heritage of the ulama and the practice of the salaf, that that is not an argument. I hope you got it. If you didn't get it, may Allah forgive me. May Allah forgive me. Now that by itself is not enough. Especially that dua is called for and is required even. And that Rasulullah and the companions raised their hands in dua. Now about salah, where does it say, except after Salah, you don't do that? If there is such a text, Salamna, we surrender and we must. But as far as the ulama have taught us, the diversity of ulama, there is no such a text. While the texts are strongly recommending that we implore Allah Azza wa Jalla, not only that, there are general texts that say if a person turns to Allah, raises his or her hands to Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah has haya to give him nothing. To return his pleas without giving him something or her something. As the text teaches. And Rasulullah raised his hands. Now, the question of after Salah, as I said, even if there were no text, the 
fact that it was not done in that specific manner after that specific time, if the reports are accurate, that does not make it if it is done wrong. All it implies that you may not do that also. Is that clear? Because arguably by itself it was not done logically, as we have seen, I hope, is untenable. But some ulama who research well, who dig well, sometimes the hadith, as Imam Ibn Taymiyyah say himself, sometimes the text is there, but you have not come across it. You don't know it. And he's saying this to the ulama and to the mufti, not to some fools amongst us. Even those. And alhamdulillah, the ulama who spend their lives living in ilm and in practice, especially if their hearts are beautiful, you know, Allah gives them and shows them. Here I have two or three texts that the ulama mention in which Rasulullah did raise his hands after finishing Salah, in leading Salah. One text, for example, it is found in the famous Musannaf of, of Ibn Abi Shayba. Musannaf Ibn Abi Shayba. Those of you who know, study Ilm and Hadith, should know the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, a compiler of Hadith like Bukhari and Muslim, and who came in the uh, early 3rd century Hijri. Rahimahullah uh, ta'ala. Yes, and etc. So he teaches on the authority of. Uh, the father of Al-Aswad Al-Amiri Rahimahullah Ta'ala who is called Al-Hajib because Al-Aswad Al-Amiri is Abdullah ibn Al-Hajib that his father who was a companion of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Sallaytu ma'a Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam Al-Fajra Falamma Sallama Inharafa Wa Rafa'a Yadayhi Wa Da'a and when he finished, I prayed with Rasulullah behind him, Salat al-Fajr, the morning prayer, the morning Salah. And then when he finished, he turned and raised his hands and prayed to Allah. This text probably nobody here knows, I am sure, almost. That's a text. The critiques of the ulama of Hadith Abu Dhabi says this is a strong text. In its isnad even. Especially if you add other texts that are weak, and remember what we said about weak earlier today, be very mindful of that. In addition to that, weak and weak becomes authoritative, strong. Even if we don't apply the rule that we talked about earlier today, and I hope you didn't forget that, that was very crucial and very important. Now, Another text teaches that uh, Rasulullah sallallahu said, "Ma min abdin yabsutu kafayhi fi duburi kulli salah." Whenever a servant of Allah extends his hands in dua after every salah and says, "Allahumma ilahi wa ilaha Ibrahim." وإسحاق ويعقوب وإله جبريل وميكائيل وإسرافيل أسألك أن تستجيب دعوتي فإني مضطر إكسا إلا كان حقا على الله أن لا يرد يديه خاليتين that Allah Azza wa takes it upon himself as a right upon himself not to turn his hands empty without giving him something this is a text if it is weak Remember what was said about the weak text in Fadail al aman But this is weak supported by the previous one. This comes strong. Of raising the hands in dua after salah. Along with the one of Rasulullah doing that. Another text, a third text I had encountered a while ago and I found it, alhamdulillah, also uh, mentioned by many ulama, which is... Uh, uh, Again, related by Ibn Abi Shayba, rahimahullah ta'ala, that Sayyiduna Abdullah ibn Zubair, the companion, saw a man raising his hand in dua 
in Salah before he said Salaamu Alaikum. Some people who don't know or thought of it that way. And when he finished, فَلَمَّا فَرَغَ مِنْهَا قَالَ لَهُ Sayyidina Abdullah bin Zubayr addressed him and said, إِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَمْ يَكُنْ يَرْفَعُ يَدَيْهِ حَتَّى يَفْرُهَ مِنْ صَلَاتِهِ The experts of hadith say the isnad of this hadith, all the elements of this isnad are thiqa, are trustworthy. He said, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, no, when he finished salah, he addressed him properly and he said, um, Rasulullah sallallahu did not use to raise his hands in dua until he finished salah. So that means, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa used to finish his salah, he used to, either always or sometimes, raise his hands in dua. QED. Point made. Raising the hands in dua by the Imam after salah al-maktuba is not even is not even bid'ah in, in a neutral sense. Doing it together should be a bid'ah hasana if there is no text about it. Because Rasulullah did raise his hand after dua and he recommended dua and dua is highly recommended by all if it is done for certain reasons, alhamdulillah, for barakah, for the strength of turning to Allah together in sincerity and in faith and in humility and humbleness, then there is nothing that should make it something that is abhorrent. And the ulama of old, like I mentioned to you, the fatwa of the alama of al-Andalus, the Mufti of Al-Andalus in his time, what was his name? Ibn Lub, Abu Sa'id Ibn Lub, Rahmahullah Ta'ala. That, that's why he told them, the only, if the only argument is that it was not done, remember he said, the principle of Tark does not imply at all that it is haram or even makruh. And especially if it is something in principle recommended like dua. And he was actually answering the question about this issue exactly. Pleading to Allah by Rasulullah Ya Allah, as'aluka bi nabiyyika sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam For example, to help me, to forgive me, to come, to come. التَّوَسُّلُ بِالنَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَعَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ Let me tell you right here that this is neither bid'ah it's not even bid'ah and even if it were bid'ah what a beautiful bid'ah it is Why is that? As a matter of fact to speak on this issue it takes hours on view of what personally I've collected of scholarly information through the centuries and through the different schools about this issue. And it takes hours by itself. But I would say this. First of all, tawassul is to ask Allah, not to ask that means itself. By something, by the grace of Allah, that Allah Azza wa loves about that thing. To grant us all prayers. As a matter of fact, the companions have pleaded to Allah not only by Rasulullah sallallahu but by relics of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Relics. You know relics? Athar? Like his hair like his, his shirt, no, like his tooth, like his shoes, you know, something that touched him. They used to use that 
to implore Allah to do something good to them. Some of you don't know that. But some of you know that, but they don't know how to connect it in the fiqhi sense to tawassul. When as related by Bukhari and Muslim and the people of the Sunan, many of these issues. For example, when the companions used to collect the hair of Rasulullah that falls from his noble head or beard. And when in Hajj he had to shave, every hair was collected by companions. And he even not only approved of that, but he says, take this hair and give it to this companion and that companion. To this woman companion and to that man companion. Indeed, I have said that somewhere else to you. All of this is authentic. And they kept that hair so meticulously. Sayyida Asma, Sayyida Aisha, Sayyida Umm Salama, Sayyida Abu Talha, and companions had that. And you know what they used to do even after Rasulullah If someone falls sick of what they used to do, they go ask Sayyida Asma or Sayyida Aisha or, or Sayyida Umm Salama or Sayyida Abu Talha or some companions, could you please, can we borrow the hair? Some would say, no, 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 we can't. So what they do is they take that hair and they immerse it in water. They bring water from their homes, say, okay, please immerse it here. They take the noble hair of Rasulullah and this is all authentic hadith, like in Bukhari and Muslim and others. And they would immerse the hair in the water, and then they would put it back in that special, meticulously kept container. And they take that water and use it for wudu, or to wash, or to drink, seeking what? Seeking what? Healing, shifa. Now what is this? What is this called? That is tawassul. Because who gives shifa? The hair? Why are they using the hair? These are the companions, how they understand the commands of Allah and His Rasul wasallam. In other words, they say, Ya Allah, by this even, this relic of your Nabi, please heal me. Look, here I kiss it, I, I wash with it, I drink its water. This is what they are doing. And they are, therefore, their hal, or even in words, their inner condition, not only sometimes in words, they are saying, Ya Allah, by this, please heal me. This is tawassul, not bin Nabi. This is tawassul by something that is touched the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa Which is greater with Allah, his hair or himself? Not only himself, body meaning soul and body. The one who was a Nabi before even Adam was created. Who said that? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Kuntu nabiyan wa adamu bain al-ruhi wa al-jasad. I was a nabi when Adam was still not fully formed between body and soul. The ruh of our nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So a person saying, I ask you by your nabi. If we can ask Allah by his hair, by the hair of our Nabi, by the clothing of our Nabi, they did all of that. By the sweat of our Nabi. Also, they did that. In other words, when they did what they did, that's what they were meaning. We are seeking that this be a barakah, a blessing. In other words, also it means we are asking for this as it is to you, Ya Allah, as you favored it, as you graced it, by this to grant us shifa. And there is no text that says, don't do that. And all the text says, the more you reveal Rasulullah the better. And that he is the means of our healing in every sense. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. 
Now, having said that, this is just a summit of a, of a pyramid of the texts and the many texts and reasons. I'm going to say this. There are explicit texts in which this was said and done. The very famous text related in the Sunan and by the Tabarani and others, which is Sahih. A blind man in the time of Rasulullah, i.e. a companion, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Mawlana Muhammad, has lost his sight and came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Ya Rasulullah, pray for me that Allah gives me back my sight. He said to him, better for you to be patient. So he told him something even better, and he says, no, please pray for me. Now this is a very important lesson. He says, do something which is better, and he says, no, in other words, something else can be done. But is not that, as good as that, perhaps, which means that you can do something, in the religious sense, that is less good than the preferred option. It's not because somebody is doing a preferred option, therefore there is no other option. Logically, it's untenable. I'm saying this because of very specific issues in fiqh that we are addressing. So he says to him, go. He didn't. The, the text nowhere said Rasulullah ﷺ prayed for him. Nowhere it says it. Some people want to infer that, but the text does not say that. The text says, go perform wudu to the maybaa, class of wudu, perform wudu, and perform turakat. And then raise your hands in dua, you know, turn to Allah in dua, and say the following. And he taught him to say in his dua, Allahumma inni as'aluka. وأتوجه إليك بمحمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم نبيك نبي الرحمة يا الله I ask you I plead to you and I turn towards you by your نبي the نبي of رحمة of merciful love أسألك وأتوجه إليك بنبيك نبي الرحمة and he says to him, and you say, listen to this, Ya Muhammad, Hakada. This is not a very serious thing. Ya Muhammad. And where was this man when he was doing that? Was he with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No, he has gone to his home, or to the masjid, and did that. And he says, and you say where you are, in other words, Ya Muhammad. إِنِّي أَتَوَجَّهُ بِكَ إِلَى اللَّهِ فِي حَاجَتِي لِتُقْضَى I turn to Allah by you for this matter and need of mine to be granted. اللهم شفعه في وشفعني في نفسي in one riwaya. وَاللَّهُ make his intercession for me. Allahumma shafi'ahu fi. In other words, let him be a shafi' for me. And make me a shafi' for myself. In other words, what I'm pleading, what I'm asking you, please accept it from me. Subhanallah. And this text is recognized by all the ulama to be authentic. And he went, and the, and the, come, and the, the text teaches, after a while he came back as though he never was blind. Okay. And in one other variant of this text, an edition, an authentic edition in accordance to most of the scholars, experts, critiques of hadith. Your details, I'll tell you. Inshallah ta'ala. The addition was, and if, in other words, in the future, you have a similar need or a need, do the same thing. 
later in a year, whatever, in 10 years, you can do the same thing and use this dua in the same phrase, same phraseology. Now, there's a lot to be said more, but what does this text teach? Tawussul bin Nabi is sunnah. It's not even bid'ah, even in the good sense. It's a fact. But there are those who, rahimahullah ta'ala, ghafarullah ta'ala, with very minimal fringe, who say, no, what was meant in that text is that the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa prayed for him. That's why he healed. The answer of the scholars was, first of all, the text does not say that he prayed for him. Second, the point whether he prayed for him was not, in this case, is irrelevant. Because what did he teach him to say is what is of concern here. And what he taught him to say is, I plead to Allah by you. This is tawassul bin Nabi. To heal me. So, overall, the question of tawassul bin Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that was the practice of the Salaf. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Imam al Hadith, Imam al Sunnah wal Jama'ah, rahimahullah ta'ala. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal in his teachings, for example, was the dua to say when you go to Hajj and visit Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you implore Allah by his Nabi. It is well established in the uh, uh, Hajj fiqh taught by Imam Ahmad to his students like Imam al-Marwahi and others. And he said that. And the likes of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah relate that this is what Imam Ahmad said. And he practiced and he used. Though Ibn Taymiyyah had ta'ala, a different view on this thing and he was the exception on this view. And that was the practice, the practice of the Salaf and of the greatest of the ulama and the staunchest of ulama al-hadith and fiqh when it comes to at-tawassul bin nabi that was self-evident and these are some of the reasons that I have mentioned to you about that as well finally and there are many more issues one more issue I'm going to mention briefly And, and that is, Hafizakumullah, uh, and that is the issue of, uh, of what? You think? The issue of what? Al Mawlid al Nabawi, Sharif. Mas'alat al Mawlid al Nabawi, Sharif. Now again, we have learned so far that if the argument about celebrating Al Mawlid al Nabawi, Sharif, is because it was not done in the time of Rasulullah or in the time of the early Salaf. And that's the argument. Now we have established from Usuli principles, from juristic principles, that that argument is untenable. Most you can say, very weak. And we have seen why. Khalas. Is there anything else? Did the Rasulullah sallallahu say, don't do that? Well, if that text exists, khalas. Salamna. That text does not exist. Neither in the Quran, or in the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When we say celebrating the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa what do they mean when they say that? If they mean to remember that, and to be happy about that. That Allah brought him into this world. And that I am a follower of his, walhamdulillah. And that during that night or that day or that month, I remember him even more. I speak of his shama'il, of his virtues and merits. I speak of his teachings. 
I perform salawat nawafil and implore Allah to strengthen my relationship with Him and to reward Him in the ways He is worthy of being rewarded. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. To be happy with that. And not to do with that anything which is haram or makro, such as intermingling with the genders, such as loud voices, such as cigarette smoking, such as playing cards, such as playing lottery. You know, they have no halid, walid in some town. They come together when well, it's an occasion to socialize. And part of that socializing is improper mixing, selling and buying even in haram ways, flirting, galatif. A'udhu billah. That's not celebrating the birth of Rasulullah Sallallahu That's not at all. That's simply finding it an opportunity to indulge the nafs. Now, outside of anything like that, that is haram or makruha, being happy with Rasulullah Sallallahu is a recommendation if not an obligation in the Qur'an. How is that? In Surah Yunus, Allah says, قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ رحمة. قُلْ بِفَضْلِ اللَّهِ وَبِرَحْمَتِهِ Tell them they should rejoice and be happy in the favors and bounties of Allah and His Rahma. That is better than all what they collect. What is Rahma in the Quran? The Quran explains the Quran. How does the Quran call Sayyidina Mawlana Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Rahma. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ And he said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّمَا أَنَا رَحْمَةٌ مُهْدَى I am but a gift of merciful love. Or loving mercy. And so Allah is also saying here, you should be happy that you have Rasulullah with you. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. To be happy for him, by him, with him, about him, to remember him and be happy, that's the norm. What's wrong in being happy? Don't be happy today, on the day he was born. Be happy any day, but not on the day of the 12th Rabi' al-Awwal or the month of Rabi' al-Awwal. That doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't make sense. It's not even logical. It's not even cultural. It cannot be shari. Be happy every day. And naturally, naturally as human beings, on the day he was born, we are happier. Number one. Number two. Now in times, and this started you know, centuries ago, when people celebrate the anniversaries of the birth of their leaders. And they promote their cultures in this way. And Muslims are forbidden, if they are forbidden, to be happy to celebrate his presence in this world and his birth. And to show that to the world how much we love him and how happy we are and an opportunity for the world to know him in the way he should be known. When we celebrate our leaders, that's a reason of maslaha. You see the concept that we spoke about, the ulama spoke about? That's maslaha. That is definitely something of a maslaha that is testified to in shara. Number three, in addition to all of that, the ulama say there are textual indicators that it is good to do that. That's why when it was done centuries ago in the sham by some rulers of Islam, the ulama of the time approved that. 
to celebrate it en masse, en masse, and to eat and to be happy and to do the good things, the moral things of obedience to Allah and of gratefulness and thankfulness to Allah. In addition to that, he said that on Mondays he fasts, the ulama mentioned. On, and Monday is what? And he said, that's the day I was born. So he is celebrating the day he was born by fasting, for example. And he said, because it's the day I was born. Indicating to us, because the ulama say, his akhlaq, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are of the akhlaq, when it comes to his personal self, he only indicates, he doesn't tell you directly this. For example, when he said, Ana Sayyidu Waladi Adam, he didn't say, Call me Sayyid. But he said, Ana Sayyidu Waladi Adam. He said it indirectly. I am the Sayyid of the children of Adam. He didn't say, Call me Sayyid. But that inferring, if we have hearts to feel, Oh my God. Because then the ulama say the occasion in which he mentioned this text that he addressed, you know, Quraysh said, Who am I? He said, You are Muhammad ibn Abdullah. He says, True, who am I? He says, You are Rasulullah. He says, True, who am I? And he said, like, when he said Muhammad, he said, I am Ana Sayyidu Waladi Adam. I am the seed of the children of Adam. There are some ulama say, this is the adab. The etiquette for him, sallallahu alayhi wa to say, why don't you say, Sayyiduna anta Sayyiduna Muhammad? But he doesn't say that to them explicitly. He leaves it to the hearts that know. So he said, I... In other words, indirectly, I celebrate Mondays, i.e. the day I was born. As though the ulama say, this is a tacit indicator that we should do that. Second, when he came to Medina and he found the Jewish community fasting on the day of Ashura, some of you know that, and he asked them, why are you doing that? They said, this is a day during which Allah saved Moses, Musa alayhi salam, and we celebrate that, and we are happy about that, and we, and we show gratefulness to Allah for that. He said, we are worthier of Musa than you. Do that as well. So the ulama say, look, he says, celebrate this occasion about Sayyiduna Musa, who was saved by Allah, and his people were saved by Allah Azawajal, because this is glorifying Allah, and celebrating Musa, السلام, and being happy. Indeed, who is greater in the scale of Allah? The birth of Muhammad وسلم, or the saving of Musa السلام, from Fir'aun, which was all great. Sayyidu Waladi Adam. If we celebrate that logically, that means celebrate his being with you, his birth. That's what the ulama are saying, like Imam Suluti, Imam al Hajar al Asqalani, and many others, rahimahullah ta'ala. The argument that, first of all, since there is no prohibition of it in the Quran or in the Sunnah, and since there are indicators actually general indicators and some close to specific that it is good to do, therefore it is a good bid'ah, if it were a bid'ah they say, rahimahullah ta'ala. And some people in the beginning were opposed to that, some of them, and then with time they changed their opinions, rahimahullah ta'ala, of what they saw of it conforming to the principles of the shara. And 
remember, for example, when the ulama like Imam Ibn Taymiyyah says, you should show reverence to the Mus'haf. Right? Remember that? Remember that issue? If somebody comes into the room with a Mus'haf, then he said, it is Mustahab to stand up. Though it was not practiced by the Salaf all, he said, because he said, nowadays, the custom has become to show reverence in our culture and in the cultures of the world to those whom they revere and respect by standing up when they come in. And if we don't do that now, it would be construed, rightly so, to be disrespect and irreverence for the word of Allah Azza wa So we should do that. I say to you, on the basis of arguments like this, nowadays, you know, and for centuries, people show reverence to their leaders and to their scholars and so on by celebrating their anniversaries. They celebrate the anniversary of Stalin and, and Lenin and, or Washington or, or Rilingham or Gandhi or X and Y and even ulama. It is so, you know, using sort of analogy towards this fatwa, if we don't do that for Rasulullah that is more of a, an act of lack of love, and lack of happiness, and lack of reverence even. As long as it is done the right way without introducing practices that are alien or contradictory to the practice of our deen in our ibadat, my beloved brothers and sisters. Now, there are many other issues, such as, you know, the uh, celebrating the uh, 15th night of Sha'ban. That's not a bad bid'ah at all. Celebrating it in the masjid in congregation, in ibadah, that's a bid'ah. But it is, in accordance to ulama of old, it is hasana. Of those who first practiced it in jama'ah, in the masajid of the sham, the likes of Khalid ibn Mi'dan. And he was a great tabi'i scholar. So this is in the first three generations. This is a salaf practice. And there are many texts in the sunnah telling us of the merits, authentic texts. There are some spurious texts, yes, and some weak texts and very weak texts. But there are even some authentic texts that teach us about the merits and the virtues of Laylatul Nisf min Shaban, the night of mid Shaban. And that Rasulullah did pray Qiyam during that night. So the only contention amongst the early ulama is may we do that in congregation. But they did not contend that, contest that individually to celebrate it. They contested it in jama'ah. But again, in view of the principles we have been learning, to say since it was not done in jama'ah, therefore it is a negative bid'ah, is not enough of an argument. But it is khair insha'Allah ta'ala in general. I will not address many, some of these because I hope Alhamdulillah we covered some of that. Shaddu al-hali ziyarati qabr al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In other words, to really go on a trip for specifically visiting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and going to visit him in his grave sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. That was the practice of our salaf always. Some have said since the time of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, and it is he who actually started this controversy, mainly he, that, no, you can't do that. It is ma'asiyah, ya Latif. It is disobedience to Allah to go on a special trip to visit the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And that was not the opinion of the rest of the ulama of his time or of before rahimahullah ta'ala or most of well majority of after them after him on the basis of the hadith la tushaddu rihalu illa ila thalafa 
at the Lafati Masajid. You should not prepare yourself on a trip except to free Masajid. Al Masjid al Haram, Al Masjid al Aqsa, and Masjid al Masjid al Haram in Mecca, Al Masjid al Nabawi, and Al Masjid al Aqsa. But again, this text, the ulama have said and responded to him in beautiful, long, usuli, fiqhi discourses of whom al-Imam, rahimahullah ta'ala, taqeed din, al-subki, who was a contemporary of his, and he was Shaykh al-Islam of the time of the Qadi al-Qudat, appointed by the Khalifa of the Abbasi in, in, in Egypt at that time, etc., who responded to him and many scholars, and who showed that that opinion is, is very untenable, and very, actually, an innovation, and it is wrong. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And that the usage of this text, and if I had time I would have elaborated upon that, the usage of this text has nothing to do with this issue. As a matter of fact, it does not hold water. But subhanallah, even great scholars fumble. Subhana, subhanallah. Even great scholars fumble. Keep that in mind. And the text that has another meaning. It does not mean that you cannot go to visit the Qabr of Rasulullah for us in a special trip. Because he says, he doesn't say visiting the grave of Rasulullah is evil. No. Many say that that's what he says. Actually, he did not say that. As a matter of fact, he says, visiting Rasulullah is in his grave, in one of the greatest virtues and merits. But somehow he says, you don't go on a trip especially for that. You should say, if you want to do something like that, you should have the niya to go to his masjid, to visit his masjid, to pray in his masjid, and then go visit his grace, وسلم, which is a great act of ibadah. That's what he says. Honestly and sincerely, others say, no, he, that's not true. But, in that part, he was still incorrect. ta'ala, And that visiting and going in a special trip to visit his grace, sallallahu alayhi wa or to visit anyone, like parents, like teachers, doing business to go. You can't say you can't. You can't go travel to do business in New York, because the text says you cannot travel except to these three masajid, because that's what the text literally says. But we have to look at the logic of that text with other texts and so on, and what we have done earlier today pertaining to that text of Kullu Bidat and Dalala, then we see light after that. Inshallah. Uh, and again, using Misbaha for Dhikr. Some have said now, oh, that's haram, or that's makro, or that's bid'ah. It is neither bid'ah nor. Haram nor makro, in accordance to the principles we have been establishing, including the practice of Sahaba, and even the fatwa of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala in this I add usually. Because he was asked even inside Salat al-Tasabih, some of you know Salat al-Tasabih, can we use misbaha to count that dhikr in Salat al-Tasabih, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, ala ala Allah, Allahu Akbar, can we use inside Salat misbaha? The answer is, briefly, he said, yes, you can do that. To help you focus on your dhikr rather than on counting. I think this is enough. And the, the answer from the texts even are very many. Insha'Allah ta'ala. Now I'm going to stop here, bi'ilillahi ta'ala. And um, first of all, uh, Allah Azza wa grant his loftiest and uh, most generous of rewards to those who have taught us in of our early predecessors and throughout the ages and throughout the schools of thought even those who were wrong in their opinions of our ulama rahimahullah ta'ala may Allah guard them and bless them 
and protect them and protect them from our of the mistakes they have made and that we have followed. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everyone that we have learned from and the references I personally have used for all these many years to compile this for you. May Allah Azza wa grant again the loftiest of rewards to those who are in these references, including including some of the last contemporary ulama of this century, Rahimahullah ta'ala, and the, and the later part of the last century, like the great teachers and ulama of Al-Maghrib, Rahimahullah ta'ala, like Sayyid Al-Imam Ahmad Al-Ghumari, and Sayyid Abdullah Al-Ghumari, and many others, Rahimahullah ta'ala, whose works in these fields were very instrumental in collecting the many, many issues and references and texts on many of these matters, especially on the matters of Bid'a and Sunnah. I cannot, I cannot, but ask you also to pray for all of them, that may Allah Azza wa Jal grant them again the most generous of rewards where they are, and help us be of those who sincerely and clearly follow in the footsteps of our Salaf, of our predecessors, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, in the right way, in the proper way, bi-imnillahi ta'ala. And may Allah reward all of those brothers, especially, and if sisters, who have contributed in helping us achieve this and do this, inshallah, and organize this from the board of trustees to our dear brother, uh, for example, Imtiaz, who, who helped me put this in computers because I don't use computers, I don't use internet, and they helped me do that so that you can see that on screens in Ayurvedic and spent quality time doing that even from outside of this state that helped write for me all these things that I instructed them to write because I don't use typewriters except very, very rarely as well, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah Azza wa reward them graciously and generously, inshallah ta'ala. And may Allah reward you for having come, for having been here patiently and diligently. And may Allah reward you by granting you and all of us the best of what I have shared with you. And keep away from you and from all of us, anything I said that was improper and that he doesn't love, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I seek refuge in Allah, by Allah, that I would say anything that he does not love, or practice anything that he does not love, or remind you of things that he loves, and yet myself forget to practice that. As-salamu